So good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be moderating this afternoon's session. Um, before I turn to our speakers, I just want to offer a couple of um, a couple of thoughts to build on on this morning. This session is focused on sharing and exploring the collective experiences and knowledge of stakeholders. We've got an excellent panel of speakers. Each of them is going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then at the end, we'll have a moderated session. And so please be ready with your questions and interventions because this will be coming from the floor today. We won't be bringing in people externally. A couple of thoughts for me in terms of following on from this morning's session. One is the importance of optimism and having a positive narrative. And I think that's really important in terms of, I think, um, almost having a license to operate and the importance of attracting talent into, into our sector, into, the, into um, uh, our industry. The second one, which I thought was really interesting coming from this morning's session, was this importance of place-based sustainability and looking at sustainability through the lens of, of, of context, which I think leads us on perhaps to uh, some of the areas that, that, that will be touched on today. And that is, we've been through a period and still go through a period of great uh, geopolitics and the intervention of ge geopolitics, but I wonder as well whether we're actually retreating from globalization and sustainability in context becomes then very important. So let me turn to our first speaker, um, Thomas Duffy. I had a great conversation with you earlier, Thomas. I know that you were a dairy farmer and a former vice uh, president of the European Council of Young F Farmers. Over to you, thank you. Super, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for inviting me here to speak and give a, a primary producer's perspective on this. Unfortunately, the uh, box thing in my presentation decided to be pretty resistant to my change. But the actual uh, title is uh, Farmer's Role in Delivering Sustainable Food Systems. So again, a very, just a, a very brief introduction uh, myself. So I was the Mochrana Firma uh, president uh, between 2019 and 2021. Mochrana Firma would be the youth organization here uh, representing young farmers, which is celebrating it eight, its 80th year and a bit unusual maybe for uh, a youth farm organization was actually the oldest farm organization in Ireland from which spawned the other ones. Um, and then the CJA, which would be the umbrella organization, which covers all uh, young farmers organizations across the EU, Vice President 2021 under Diana Lenzi, the President there. Um, I've been involved in policy formation for around about 10 years, depends on where you decide where it starts. Uh, I think I attended my first lobby exercise in Brussels at about uh, 19, when other people were probably doing more entertaining things with their, in their teens. Uh, and then uh, my educational background is Master in Environmental Resource Management, along with a primary degree, uh, courtesy of Chagas, um, in Ballyhays Agricultural College and uh, Dundalk, Univer uh, Dundalk IT. Um, so, Again, I suppose I am not going to uh, lecture people who know better than me on the very concept of sustainability, but instead I wanted to focus a little bit on what maybe a primary producer would see as uh, sustainability. And particularly maybe this term gets thrown around a lot. I'm generally quite reluctant to use it in certain contexts because it can be over overutilized. Um, but it is very essential for a primary producer that that the people that they are dealing with, whether they be policymakers or researchers, understand that sustainability is a, a three pillar. I know there are additional interpretations, but certainly I would stick with the traditional uh, environmental, economic, social. Um, the primary uh, processor's role is key to every one of these. Uh, just as an example, um, particularly on greenhouse gas emissions, and in Ireland, with such a large percentage of greenhouse gas emissions uh, contributed from agriculture, it is a particular focus. But we're already seeing uh, private enterprises moving from scope one and scope two emissions reductions down to scope three emissions reductions. And for farmers, that's going to be extremely challenging because the first question that's going to be asked is, how is this going to be facilitated? What do we actually have to do? And more importantly, are we going to get rewarded for this? but including as well in land use uh, reductions and obviously with the challenges we're going to have with a growing, a growing population and resource demand. So in terms of environmental, in that environmental pillar, what exactly does a primary producer worry about? Um, generally speaking, the a very edge of that will be adoption of new practices and new technologies. And those are quite important together that they're operated. Um, the challenge can sometimes be false dons. So the adoption of a certain technology, which then proves to be less than effective, can undermine the trust of the primary producer uh, in 
particularly in knowledge transfer. So we have to be very careful about that, but at the same time, the rate at which we have to go in order to address the likes of climate change, the likes of water quality issues, doesn't leave a huge amount of time to you know, wait for these things to, to operate. So we need to be very fast, but we also need to be very cognizant that agriculture is a multi-generational activity, and it's very, very difficult sometimes to um, change those. Uh, economics, I think the major concern at the moment, uh, for at least for EU producers, has been the shifting balance between market orientation and subsidised common goods. And this question of whether the likes of uh, the EU, the CAP project, um, is there to ensure that we are able to survive in uh, either globalised or even an internal market, or is it there to provide for common goods which we ultimately will not be returned for from the market? What is the role of the market in that as well is quite difficult for farmers sometimes to see. Um, and very often, unfortunately, their considerations in this entire green transition are not taken very seriously and are not considered. Uh, and finally, and this is a really an underrepresented area, social. Um, farmers are, yes, broadly quite isolated uh, as a practice, um, uh, but that means all the more dependent on the network and the conductivity between uh, the different communities and where they get their information from. Some good, some bad. Social media has fundamentally altered that in a way that it has altered the rest of society. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that there's always cognizant of that. Um, but as I say, these are key between the other pillars um, and the facilitation and the motivation to actually participate in things that can make us more sustainable, be those on an environmental or an economic front. So the four key challenges in terms of adopting sustainable food systems, um, some, again, are talked about quite a lot. Uh, cost of production, this is pretty much across the entire spectrum of farming. Uh, it, though it does vary by enterprise, this is more challenging, particularly in Irish context, and I'm just talking in Irish context here, EU context will differ. It's most acute in the beef and lamb production, where it's incredibly difficult to make a full-time income. Um, and uh, the horticulture sector, which we've seen massive declines in uh, cr across the last 30 years uh, in Irish production. Whereas in dairy and in some elements of tillage, the return on investment may be enough to justify a longer-term investment that could potentially yield better, whether that be from market or from policy. This is actually one that is not talked about a lot, time poorness. Um, I, tr I thought about using time poverty, but it didn't sound right. Um, this is, again, dependent on the sector, and it depends on the difference. So again, in your beef and lamb sector, you're talking about mostly part-time farms, off-farm income. Uh, they do not have the same potential full-time contribution that they can give, but equally in the dairy sector, you are going to have particular periods of time that you have to be cognizant of. In particular, trying to... Uh, do knowledge transfer in March and April in Ireland in such a seasonable calving system, any advisor will already tell you that's not a runner. Um, but there are other times of the year where it's equally as challenging. Uh, I've literally started calling this conference season at the moment because it's great, everything has been condensed down to it, but it's nearly now as busy as, as calving season is. Um, so, but as I say, it, it depends on seasonal phase, the implementation of practices can be time consuming. Cost of technology, some technologies I am perpetually confused that they haven't been adopted yet because their cost of, is not really significant. But there are a lot of other technologies, particularly much more um, advanced technologies, much more cutting end technologies, where we need to start talking about how we're going to finance these. Um, an example that I've come across recently, and it's, it's a very minor example, um, but in some of my German colleagues were explaining to me that electrified farm vehicles, for instance, are actually supported under investment support under the common agricultural policy. That's not the case in Ireland. Um, I recently priced replacing it because I'm always trying to remove fossil fuels from my farm. And for a similar cost of a, a replacement teleporter, 56,000 for a fossil fuel powered one, 92,000 for an electric vehicle. So we can see the challenge in that. But there are a number of others stuff like slurry acidification or uh, anaerobic digestion and others cost technology and then consumables separate I would say from the capital investment of technology so these are the likes of your sustainable inputs so whether you can afford as an example one of the things that we would like to do more so in Ireland I think is produce more native grains in our rations but the difficulty is the challenge of actually a farmer with no potential return um, investing in that or the likes of uh, inhibitors 
So, as I say, the contradictions between sustainability, so you have the, I suppose, the unique nature of agriculture, the preservation of existing resources often loses, uh, often lost to changing policy, e.g. an example of forestation, the loss of high nature value uh, to forestation in order to achieve climate targets. Consumers, the gap between the consumers' stated desires and the actual willingness to pay is a major challenge for primary producers. Verification the onerous level of data collection that might be, particularly as it ties to the likes of um, time poorness um, for either market efforts or policy validation, and the ongoing changes that we see in policy. Um, so incentives given for one approach and then there's a change and, and farmers sometimes not being given the time to bed in that approach and see the results. So uh, I think I'm on time, I, perfectly on time. So that is a broad uh, coverage. These are some of the, uh, over the time, all of those pictures were generated from my own home farm uh, uh, for this. But as I say, the, the overall, the challenge is quite multifaceted, and I think it's wrong to simplify it, and particularly some other stakeholders say, well, if we just pay farmers enough, they'll do X. It's simply not that simple. Most of the people in this room know this. Um, you have to be able to address every single one of those challenges in order to achieve what you want. Thanks. Thank you very much, Thomas. So um, please do keep your questions for the uh, end of this session. Now, it's a great pleasure to introduce Brendan Dunford. I guess Brendan doesn't need much of an introduction to you. Uh, he is the director of the uh, Burren Bio Trust, and looking forward to your presentation, Brendan. Thanks very much, Wayne. I uh, appreciate it, and thanks for the invitation. Owen, oh, I don't know how, how you left me into this conference, but here I am, so I'm going to make the most of it. <laughs> um, the blame is on him. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about... Um, this theme of engaging farmers. So I'm from a farming background. I've been working with farmers for the last 30 years, and I've been working on the theme of ecosystem services. So just sharing some learnings and putting forward some areas maybe for further research. This is a lovely picture from the barn about uh, three weeks ago. Lucy Shannon, a young farmer, is bringing her cattle back up onto the hill for the winter, her 24, 25 cattle. Great stock, will produce great wheelings. So she's a, she's a producer. But as well as she's sustaining a thousand-year-old tradition of um, transhumans in the burn, and you can see behind her there's about 800 people engaging in a community event, a great social event. So this is the essence of ecosystem services. Um, they could be cultural services, as in this case, as well as provisioning, supporting, regulating. So I'm privileged to have worked for the last 25 years in the burn with farmers who are producing these ecosystem services people who are providing educational services on their land, who are managing water supplies, who are repairing stone walls, which are part of our cultural heritage and very important for the tourism industry in the Burren. We have farmers who are producing um, uh, quality meat, as I said before, and biodiversity. It's the big one in the Burren. Uh, I suppose all of those people would see themselves as farmers and as food producers. Um, I would see them as something much more than that. And I think, in general, the reason I'm here today is that I'd love to imagine a future where farming is about much more than food production. I think farmers are selling themselves short and are being sold short if we limit what to do simply to food production. And I know the barn's exceptional, but everywhere has got something amazing to offer in terms of ecosystem services. So in the barn, the key services we wanted our farmers to produce were food, biodiversity, water quality and cultural heritage. So the little case study we have um, uh, it just shows you how we've gone about doing that um, over the last number of years. And it's really about kind of pointing um, farmers in a new direction, in a direction we feel um, will give them a more sustainable future uh, on the landscape, uh, a continuation of 6,000 years on the landscape. We want to make sure there's a brighter future there, and we want to do it through the provision of ecosystem services and reward farmers for that. I suppose the core of what I wanted to say is that, I've, like, how, how do we do this? If we can mobilise our farming families right across Ireland and Europe to address our biodiversity, water quality, um, nutritional challenges, climate challenges, if we can mobilise our farming communities to address those, amazing things can happen. And in our limited experience in the barn, it's about three things. It has to make financial sense, so payments, but how to pay is, is a challenge for me. Secondly, how, how do we do this? How do we farm for ecosystem services to optimize them in an integrated way? So there's a lot of research and advisory work involved in that. 
And the piece that we always miss, and I'm delighted to be joined by Maeve later on here today, um, is the heart piece. How do we convince the farming community and all the players in the sector that farmers have a bigger destiny, that this is a real important purpose, this is the call of our times, to believe in what they do, because when you believe in doing something, you'll do better. But that's a key challenge, and I think that's what's undermined the success and impact of our environmental schemes for decades now. Um, it's that purpose, that sense of purpose, that heart piece. In the burn, um, this is what we've done. We've created a system where we reward farmers for their environmental outcomes using a very simple scoring system. The more we deliver for the environment, the more we get paid. So I'm, I'm all for investing public funding in uh, farming, uh, but only on the condition that farmers deliver. And there are simple and effective ways of doing that. And we've shown in an enormously complex landscape uh, like the burn, the more you deliver, the more you get. Very easy to monitor, assess, and so on, and reward accordingly. When you produce those rewards, farmers will want to earn as much as they can. So then you need to support farmers to invest in the infrastructure to deliver those outcomes. Um, so we have a hybrid approach. We pay for the outcome, but we also pay or co-fund the work that it requires to deliver the outcomes. So it could be fixing up watering points, repairing walls, putting in new tracks, or putting in um, new gates, or removing encroaching species. So a twin uh, hybrid approach to the payment. Farmers love this payment system. Why? Because they have total freedom to farm. Nobody's telling them what to do or how to do it. They have an incentive. If they want to reach it, we support them to deliver it with funding and with advice. Uh, and farmers also love fair payments. If you hand out money not to do things, people don't respect that. If you pay for delivery, people, farmers, really do respect that in our experience. We've done a lot of research. Uh, previously with Tagus, as part of a, a European Life Funded project, moving to new uh, efficient seeding, feeding systems for cattle on the barn, solving a huge problem, but using Irish sourced beef or um, um, uh, barley, feeding cattle, uh, using a system which improves animal performance, environmental outcomes and water quality as well as not affecting the farmer's pocket. So there are solutions. We're not talking about going backwards, we're talking about going forwards using the best of new science. In terms of water, we've looked at solar and wind systems of delivering water onto cattle up in the barn. We've looked at different grazers and so on. So there's a lot of research. But the key thing about the research we've done is always been with the farmers. It's been within the farmer, uh, uh, farming community. It's been side by side with the farmer. The indigenous knowledge, that practical knowledge, is invaluable to us as scientists. So we've been leaning very heavily on that co-creation and using farmers to demonstrate the solutions as well. And of course, uh, the advisory services. And for us, the key thing about this is we have a local office right in the heart of the community. Farmers love the local. When we ask them what's the favourite thing about the programme, they, they don't say the money, they say the fact that they can go to the office and they can find, if there's a problem, they can meet me and get that problem sorted out. They don't have to go on the phone to Wexford or to Dublin. They can actually get local advice. And that's hugely important, that local perspective um, on, on that. And it has worked, uh, and we were lucky to have data for uh, 13 years across about 20, uh, well, about 14,000 hectares of land with up to 300 farmers. That's a very significant data set. And hand on heart, we can say that every year since we began the process at a local level in 2010, the average field score, which is a reflection of the environmental health, has improved. It initially from 6.8, and when we finished last year, it was about 7.9. That, to me, is a testament that farmers can deliver if they're properly rewarded, supported, and encouraged to, 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 um, to deliver. And that's meaningful change on the ground, moving from damaging systems to restoring habitats. We did an external, through the Department of Ag, uh, assessment on this, and it's, you know, today it is phenomenal, not just in terms of the environmental outcomes, which are worth about 22 million, but also in terms of new job creation and in terms of uh, money into the local economy. So economically, environmentally, and socially, these things really can work and can deliver. We, had, we moved from the local to the national last year, and obviously there's going to be a bit of a transition, but unfortunately things are slipping back. Um, and I won't get into that now, but that's just the data that we have to, to show. But that's not to say that this system cannot work when it's delivered properly. The final couple of things I wanted to say were about this heart piece, about this sense of purpose. Um, I love what you said before, Wayne, about positivity. To me, that's the key thing. Um, uh, if we can be positive and we can be solution orientated, we're really going to, to, to make a big difference. There's a lovely quote here, to change the world, let's start by changing the way we talk about it and let's highlight these initiatives that are having a positive impact on people and the planet to renew our confidence and disperse into action. We're not really doing that very well at the moment with the farming community uh, around the theme of ecosystem services. We need to do it much better. Secondly, I think it's not just a message, it's a messenger. 
uh, that isn't ideal. For me, it's about giving farmers a message. They should be the spokesperson for sustainability, not a politicians or a scientists, all of whom have, have a role to play, but we need to give the voice back to the farmers in terms of this discussion. And we set up a beautiful little program about five years ago called, called the Farming for Nature Ambassador Program, where we identified farmers right across Ireland, young, old, male, female, organic, conventional, tillage, dairy, beef. These are my heroes when it comes to the whole conservation agenda, ecosystem services, because I can talk about it, but they're out there doing it every day. Yet we don't hear that much about them. They might not be producing a huge income, but they're creating a living for themselves on the farm. They're managing the farm in a very environmentally sustainable way. And to, 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 to an individual, they're all reaching out into their communities. So socially, environmentally, economically, these are the role models, and we need to hear more from them. And we have a lovely award ceremony next week where we have a farm for nature in Northern Ireland. And I'm looking at Wayne. Scotland is next stop, Wayne, so watch out. Uh, this is some of Morris Deasy, who's uh, using minimum tillage down Tipperary, brewing beer. Um, doing all sorts of wonderful stuff. I think he does some research with Tagus around um, anaerobic digestion as well. So a phenomenal uh, character from a ph phenomenal family. We have Colin Galvin out in the hills of Connemara who farms sheep for a living, but also is part of a team of people who go out there controlling rhododendron. And this is a paid service. So they're farming for food, but also farming to protect their wonderful environment out there. And again, very involved in the community. Uh, uh, we, we have um, Mimi uh, Crawford down in, in Tipperary producing amazing milk, but also amazing environmental um, educational projects. She's producing a whole range on a very small piece of land, making a good living uh, doing that. So I think we need to hear these stories uh, from these people uh, as part of the change that we need to see happen in Ireland. Uh, these are great stories. And to kind of tap into that, we set up a little project um, with Byrne Bio last year called The Horse's Mouth. So this is where we get some of these inspiring farmers to visit other farmers in their area or in their county maybe and just talk to them about what they've done and what the host farmer might consider doing based on their experience. It's a lovely peer-to-peer -peer sharing, mentoring, supporting kind of a role. So we pay the farmer to go to visit the other farmer who makes a small contribution and the magic that happens. We've only done it two or three years now with about 100 farmers. It's fantastic. So these farmers are not just doing great things, but they represent a learning resource uh, as well for, for other farmers. So finally, um, Owen asked me to maybe put out a few, is that 10 minutes? <laughs> That's nine minutes. <coughs> Final slide, research needs to support farmers. So I think, I think th the notion of research is hugely important. We want to build forward better. But to do that at a local level is really important because ecosystem services are very context specific. So the burn is different from Connemara, is different from Wicklow and so on and so forth. So keeping it local and targeted. To me, research really for this purpose needs to be co-created with farmers. We need to rely on that handed down indigenous knowledge uh, very much uh, more so. I love the fact that when I was doing my research, I consider myself to have been an embedded researcher. I lived in the community with the farmers for three years and that was the makings of me and, and my re research at the time. In terms of payments, I think the structure of payments is critical, and that's one of the big issues I'd have with acres as a structured. There's a cap on what farmers get for delivering services which we desperately need as a society, and I think that shouldn't be. So the structure of payments in order to incentivize delivery is really important. Uh, uh, we need more research on that. We need to find ways of in incorporating uh, a farmers' ecosystem service footprint into the market price. That might be aspirational, but I think we have to look at it. For the moment, we depend on policy to step in, but we need to look at um, the market as well. And we need to look at ways of bringing private sector funding in. We're relying too much on CAP and the Department of Ag. We need to find other sources of funding for this and to do research into mechanisms through which we can make that happen. Finally, practical uh, research. Feeding systems, I think, are critically important. Feeding systems which are targeted to the landscapes, to balance what the landscape doesn't offer to the grazing animal, for instance. We need practical advice around, um, you know, uh, and research around using satellite collars to cater for the off-farm worker now and for, you know, these big open landscapes which you need to farm but aren't that efficient. So there's lots of solutions like satellite collars. Monitoring how best to easily capture these ecosystem services. Uh, there's different systems in place we might look at for that. The key one, and I'm going to let Maeve answer this, how do we motivate farmers to deliver more ecosystem services? We're shockingly poor on that type of research, I think, here. We need to do way more, and I think Anna Mackin-Welsh and um, uh, her colleagues in Togask are doing a lot on that, and Maeve as well. 
And finally, one of the, one of the problems we consistently encounter every time a uh, new CAP cycle comes is the IT systems can only do this, they can't do that. That's shocking, this day and age, that, that we're still at that stage. So we need to future-proof these IT systems to enable more impactful and adaptive AES. Thank you very much. Brendan. Huge amount uh, to absorb, and I'm sure we'll come back to that during the next session. So, great pleasure to in introduce uh, Philip Carroll, Chairperson of uh, Meat Industry Ireland. Um, look forward to your presentation, Philip. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, and thanks very much uh, to Jerry for the invitation uh, today. So, I represent Meat Industry Ireland. We, we, um, we look after the interests of the primary processing sector across the beef, sheep meat, pig meat and poultry sectors in Ireland. Uh, so I want to talk about some of the things that we've been doing by way of uh, trying to reach some of the targets that have been set by government for us. Just take you through uh, the importance of the beef sector, just a summary on that, the efficiency of Irish beef production investments to date and results that have been achieved. Um, and I would emphasize that we haven't just started yesterday or the day before, we've started quite a long time ago. Uh, our priorities uh, to 2030, which are in tune with uh, the uh, Climate Action Plan uh, program and the expected impact of those. So just on the importance of the beef sector to start with, the beef sector in, in our country is probably the mainstay of many of the rural communities in Ireland, as it is in many other countries as well. They're all located in rural locations. We have uh, approximately 50 processing sites. Uh, each of those processing sites contributes something of the order of about 100 million to the local communities in which they reside. Uh, the multiplier effect of the activities of those uh, companies is for every 1 million increase in output, they generate 2.1 million in local communities. And these are validated figures uh, conducted. The sector accounts for a third of gross agricultural output in this country, and nominally the, the export value from the meat sector, from the beef sector specifically. The meat sector about 3.5 billion, the beef sector about 2.5 billion. Uh, and the main thing for me to say today is the sector is absolutely committed to achieving government targets in whatever way we can do to influence that. Just to give a, a, the global impact of our footprint, uh, we are one of the lowest uh, footprint per kilo of beef among the top six European countries. And when you look at that in a wider context, if we were to reduce our production by 100,000 tonnes, that would have uh, significant, uh, that, would, that in itself would be a significant drop in production and the viability of the processing sector in this country. But by comparison, um, if that moved to Mercosur, it would result in 5.5 billion tonnes of CO2 additional emissions. So if you look at that in a broader context, the, the, the graph on the left-hand side is showing South American production uh, in the orange and the emissions associated with that production in blue. You can see how high the emissions are over, over the, the volumes. The next largest one is the US, and, and the third one is the European Union. And you can see where the emissions are. And within the European Union, across here to the right-hand side, you see that Ireland and Italy are at the lowest level of uh, emissions per kilogram of beef produced. Our members are engaged right across the board. In all of these are the three largest members that we have. They together account for something of the order of about 75% of beef production in this country. So ABP here on the right are engaged in carcass performance and greenhouse gas, gas emission benchmarking at farm level and on a, an individual animal level. 2020 club here is KEPAC, one of the other significant operators in cooperation with Tier Lawn, looking to integrate the dairy and beef sector in a more constructive manner by producing uh, calves from the dairy sector that are more suitable for the beef sector. And this is a significant initiative around how that sector needs to be integrated because we've moved from a situation 
where the suckler herd was more than 50% of our beef output. It is now uh, in, a, in decline such that the dairy sector is now producing the larger proportion of beef uh, in, in, in the economy. The, the third one here is the New Fort Farm. It's a Dawn Farm initiative working with the Farmers Journal, with McDonald's and with Chagask, uh, trying to assess and understand and improve the performance of the suckler herd. Across all of our plants, since 2015, we've spent on 150 million in sustainability initiatives. These initiatives, not only the efforts we've made, but the efforts that the farmers are making, the efforts that all of the uh, structural organizations, such as Chagas, Sky, CBF, Board Bia, uh, uh, and, and others are doing, our carbon footprint assessment under the Board Bia Sustainable Beef and Lamb assurance scheme has showed a decline of 9% or one kilogram of CO2 per, per kilogram live weight since 2015. Younger finishing ages have mitigated up to 400,000 ton of, of uh, CO2 annually since 2010. At processing level, the beef sector now sources 92% of animals from SBLAS uh, uh, schemes. The, the, um, Processors have enhanced their engagement with farmers in relation to sustainability performances and were very active in the whole space on biodiversity. Since 2015, processors who are members of Board Bia's Origin Green Sustainability have reduced emissions intensity by almost 20% per tonne of output, cut energy intensity by 30%, achieved zero waste to landfill, and reduced the absolute water use by 8% and dropped water intensity by 22%. So these are real achievements that have occurred over the last number of years. We have a terrific infrastructure in this country and we're very fortunate to have it through Animal Health Ireland, uh, which looks to healthier animals producing more, le le less, more efficient and less emissions uh, through Me Technology Ireland which is housed here in this campus, uh, which was established quite a number of years ago, 2017 now at this stage. And they're working across a whole range of sustainability initiatives, including breeding lower methane, uh, emitting animals. We're working with Chagask's signpost farm program and with Origin Green, as I've just mentioned. And in all of these, our industries are contributing funding towards all of those initiatives. So there is an integrated approach taking place in Ireland. Uh, in, uh, in terms of driving progress to 2030, I mean, the key objectives we have is to increase the proportion of finished animals originating from the dairy herd. And, and that has reached some 63% as we know now. So we need to improve the integration uh, of our relationship with the dairy sector. And that's an ongoing process which is uh, becoming more embedded as time goes by. Our focus will be on breeding strategies that utilize the commercial beef value index, the methane trades and the carbon sub index. And this objective is to ensure that calves are more suitable, as I've said before, for beef production. Uh, we have these stronger uh, links through the various programs that I mentioned a little bit early, earlier. And we have now agreed this year, starting this year, to have a national genotyping program, predominantly funded by government, but significantly funded, of course, by farmers and also by the, our industry and the dairy industry. And that's unique and a first. We're working with farm organizations through what we call the Beef and Sheep Vision Group, this is a group that was established in, in consequence to a government report on Vision 2030 for the, for the, for the agri-food sector. Some of the key things that we can influence, these are eight of the significant actions that can be taken to deliver emissions reductions by 2030. From our industry perspective, the most significant one and the most significant of all of that group of actions is the first one reducing the age of slaughter by 2.7 months. The age of slaughter at the moment is now at 26 months or thereabouts. In 2010, it was at uh, 30 months. We've made huge progress 
over that period of time. We can make more progress over the next number of years. Uh, these are a range of the priorities that we have, which I've probably touched on many of them already. I'm not going to go into that. It's a difficult one to read in any event. But I mean, the big one here is the age of, of finishing, but also around the genetics piece and the work that we've done on that, which I've summarized many of so far. We know that driving genetic improvement can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 400,000 tonnes per annum, and we will continue to do that to 2030. We know that reducing early finishing can potentially reduce uh, emissions by 820,000 tonnes a year by 2030. And I think that's on the conservative side. Many of our members would have a view that we can re reach a megaton by 2030. Um, I've covered probably some of these items, and I, I'm conscious that Owen is looking at me now with an, in, intensity at this stage. These are some of the things that we have been working out at processing level. Uh, much of everything else that I've talked about is happening at farm level, and we absolutely need to work more intensively in the future with farmers to achieve the gains that we need to get, reach. But on, on processing level, the examples of the targets that our, processor, our processors are aiming for are reducing scope one and two emissions by more than 50% by 2030, and also go, so scope three emission targets aimed at reducing emissions by around 30% by 2030. So in conclusion, much of the ambition that we're talking about here depends, number one, on our relationship with the infrastructure of the state through those various organizations I've spoke about, critically on our excellent farmer suppliers. Uh, but these are all captured in the National Climate Action Plan. So it rounds it off in many ways. Our industry is ambitious in terms of its share of uh, the lifting. Um, we've already demonstrated that we've done a fair bit of that. Sector has invested significantly in infrastructure towards that. We are committed to delivering even more to 2030 and beyond. Government and industry, though, must work together. We would like to see more government leadership on some of the initiatives that they have put into their own national climate plan. Now, there isn't enough engagement on that. We're going into year four of the first of a five-year carbon budget period and we really need to up our game quite significantly over the next period. Customers are accelerating uh, ambitions to secure net zero. They're not willing to pay, and we need to have that discussion. That's very important. There are great opportunities for Irish beef, we believe, in the future, but we have to be the solutions provider to gain that. Otherwise, we can get swamped by what's happening around the world. So there you go. Thank you very much. Um, sorry if I ran over a little bit. Thank you very much, Philip. So last but not least, least um, welcome, Maeve. We're looking forward to your presentation um, on the role of the consumer in delivering um, sustainable food systems. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wayne. So good, good, af good afternoon or evening, wherever we're at this stage, everybody. Um, so, um, we, Brendan mentioned something about, he said the producer is key, but you'll probably be more familiar with the expression that the consumer is king. And implicit in that is, I suppose, a view that if consumers behave in a particular way, that they influence the behaviour of others along the chain. So, I suppose a simple way to think about then how come, what's the role of consumers as part of a sustainable food system is to think, if consumers want something that's sustainable, um, all we have to do then is to, is to, is to leave them to create the market whereby producers and others will um, respond by filling the demand for that market. But obviously, you know, it's not as simple as that and I'm just going to go through a few reasons why it's not and, and how we can deal with that. So I suppose, first of all, consumers are not homogeneous. They have different levels of knowledge, different values, different motivations and ultimately different behaviours. Secondly, sometimes they're unable to change uh, for reasons that are individual to themselves, but also part of that broader system that we're talking about um, as well. 
Sometimes they're unwilling to change, maybe don't recognize their own responsibility with regards to change, and that has particular implications for others that they think have responsibility to, to effect that change. And sometimes, and critically, I suppose, in terms of thinking about the integrated supply chain, there are misaligned preferences and perspectives with regard to what's important and what should be done along the chain. So what farmers might want and value might be different to what consumers might want and value, and, and there can be a misalignment there that needs to be addressed. And also, there isn't a market for all types of goods. Some goods um, will not be produced in or will not be uh, paid for by consumers, and we've had that mentioned by Brendan as well. Um, so there are these public goods that are not going to be uh, produced as a result of the, the consumer. And I suppose the big question for us all is, you know, do we have clarity in terms of what we mean by sustainable behaviours and a sustainable food system? I think there's a lot of confusion within the scientific community. And therefore, if we're not clear on what sustainability is and what sustainable consumption patterns are, how can we expect consumers to lead, that, lead the way in terms of having sustainable behaviours themselves? So just working through some research that has been done and to illustrate how consumers are not homogeneous, just some research that was done in Germany recently, they segmented consumers based on uh, their perspectives in relation to pesticide food products, and they investigated their uh, perspectives in relation to pesticide-free milk, cheese, and butter. And obviously, we all know that there shouldn't be pesticides in these products, but that's not what's meant. It's meant that these products are produced with feeds that haven't um, used pesticides. So just to clarify there, they found that, you know, the majority of consumers are not willing to pay more for these types of products. Some of them would be willing to pay more. Some of them don't know yet and have to think about it. And some of them think, are kind of sitting on the fence. You know, they have some positive and negative perspectives around it. So a lot of heterogeneity there. Research that was done in Denmark and Italy, asking consumers what was important to them, or what we call their food values. We found that uh, our, th these researchers found that about a third are private benefit seekers, so they want benefits that are unique to themselves. Um, and interestingly, they had the lowest levels of objective and subjective knowledge compared to the other segments as well. So they don't know a lot about food systems, and they're not that motivated to find more knowledge about it as well. There's about a third that are sustainability focused, so that's taking quite a holistic perspective in terms of what they mean by sustainability, and a third that are motivated by naturalness and health. So again, just quite significant variations there in terms of what's important to consumers and therefore what they might be motivated uh, to, to do in terms of their own behaviour. In terms of barriers, this is just a review that we did looking at short food supply chains and trying to, so consumers might be motivated to purchase through food through short food supply chains, but there are many barriers in their way in terms of affecting that, that behaviour, even if they wanted to. So they may not be always able to, there may not be a local market or a local farmer whereby they can buy these products. It can be expensive to buy more local food. Um, they might, may not have the time to go and search for such foods. And also, again, looking at it from a systems perspective, they may not trust the authenticity of that food, which comes back to um, aspects like standards and labels and things like that. They may not be, be knowledgeable, but I said, even if they have the motivation, there are barriers in place uh, that may prevent them from affecting that behavior. Looking at alignment with others, this is some a review that we did looking at a cow-calf separation, which we know is an emotive issue. And consumers in, in, across a number of countries were asked, should dairy calves be separated from the cow within the first few hours of birth? And interestingly, while almost half said no, 44% said yes, which you might be surprised at, and some of them were neutral, and that was in the US. And when they were asked why, um, this was one consumer from Brazil, they said, I believe that the stimulus generated by the calf suckling and the emotional connection between them are beneficial to both the quality of the product and the health of the animal. So they're saying you shouldn't remove the cow from the calf because it's beneficial for the, for the animal, but also thinking to, back to themselves and the private benefits of their own health. Con, uh, farmers, um, they were concerned about animal welfare in terms of removing the calf, also concerned about labour, worker welfare and worker stress, and the requirements in terms of changing the system. And just to illustrate some more quotes there, the, the farmers, they were saying the reason they don't do it is the failure rate of calves uh, not feeding off their mothers and the importance of them getting the colostrum within the first few hours. So they saw that as a very much a negative aspect in terms of animal welfare, whereas obviously a lot of consumers see it as a positive aspect. So there's a, there's a misalignment there. 
And interestingly, there were some of the consumers in the US and Canada, they believed that farmers should se separate the calves from the mother, not only for the calves' safety, but so that the mother can rest. So kind of putting a human kind of perspective in terms of how they, how they think about it. So different perspectives within consumers and different perspectives within, across farmers and producers. But I suppose the, one of the things that I suppose is required in terms of consumers is that um, element of social learning, that they think, you know, just putting the cow, the, the cow and the calf together or removing the cow and the calf, they think that's fairly simple. But as this farmer here said, if he had to change his system with regards to separating the cow and the calf, he said, I would have to change the yard management, I would have to change grazing management, insemination times, bull management, and also the surviving of the calves will be a bit less. So there's a huge, significant change within the farm system for that small change that's or, what, or what's perceived as a small change by the consumer. And I think that very much highlights the need for social learning um, within the, the farmers and the and, and consumers there. So looking at dietary adjustments, um, we had some work this morning that showed us um, about meat consumption and it's not really going down, it's actually going up. And this is some analysis that we did of the FAO uh, balance sheet data looking at uh, the sources of protein uh, that are being consumed. And we can see that the, the dom by far the dominant amount of protein consumed within Europe is animal-based and we don't really see a huge amount of change in, with regards to the, the breakdown there. And in Europe, we have a 60-40 breakdown versus a 40-60 breakdown in other countries. So 40% is animal derived in, in other parts of the world. So a significant shift possibly uh, required there. But consumers, in mo many consumers in Europe don't want to change. And um, there was some nice work done a while ago that talked about why consumers don't want to change. And they talked about the four ends. Consumers want to consume meat because they believe it's natural, it's normal, it's necessary and it's nice. So consumers have very good ways of justifying to themselves why they should continue to eat meat. And even though they might have cognitive dissonance around it in terms of animal welfare, they just like, they like meat. And you know, I think that's a lesson for us all, particularly in terms of meat industry Ireland, the sensory aspects of meat are crit critically important. And obviously there are barriers in terms of plant-based proteins. I'm working on a couple of projects in that space myself, and you'll hear from Mark Fenlon tomorrow around that. But there are barriers in terms of health and taste and price as well around that. Um, so going on to the public goods and where responsibility lies, Board B did some nice work looking at the carbon um, consumer's perspective with regards to carbon, and they asked them where they they asked consumers where they thought responsibility for addressing carbon lies. And as you can see down here in the fourth the fourth row here, you know, me as an individual, consumers don't really see addressing carbon as an issue for themselves. They see it as being the responsibility for government and policymakers, big manufacturers, and, and the wider society, but not necessarily for themselves as, com as consumers. And if we look at, you know, the importance of it again, going back to the values we were talking about, they do think, you know, it's important to them to reduce waste, but in terms of reducing their carbon footprint, that's way, way down the, down the list there. And, but it goes back again to the whole thing that we were talking about this morning, I think our, uh, Karen was talking about the importance of education. Because when you ask consumers, what do they, sorry, I had the wrong slide there. When you ask consumers, what do they understand by uh, carbon footprint, they don't really understand it. But when you ask them what do they understand with regard to food waste, they do understand it. So there's a good body of work there. And the point I'm making here about the unfunded mandate is, you know, a lot of things that consumers want um, so even though carbon isn't up there, there's a lot of things that they want, like animal welfare, but that they're not prepared to pay for, which results in an unfunded mandate for, for farmers and for others. But I think there's a body of work that we need to do to unpick what we mean by um, willingness to pay or willingness to buy. Uh, one of my colleagues who's here, um, Nima, is doing some work looking at consumer acceptance in relation to the bioeconomy. And, and if we're looking at acceptance, you know, we can accept things in terms of being supplied on the market. We can accept things in terms of buying them for other people in our household. We can accept them in, in terms of being willing, willing to consume them. But it's another step then to ask, are we willing to pay more for So there's a whole level of measures in terms of acceptance that we need to look at. And I think to date, a lot of the literature has looked at willingness to pay, which is probably too simple of a, of a question in terms of, of asking consumers about their, their perspectives in relation to sustainability aspects. 
So just then a few brief thoughts in terms of how we might involve them, and some of this was again mentioned this morning. I think first of all, though, we need to identify and engage with relevant affected individuals in terms of any, any changes we want to make in terms of a sustainable food system. We need to look at advocacy and, and representative groups. So we're talking here about you know, organizations like the Celiac Society and other groups like that. And then we need to think about how can we create platforms where our mechanisms to engage them. And these are just a few ideas. There's many other ideas that we can, we can throw out there. Short food supply chains, I think, shouldn't be underestimated. That direct connection between producers and consumers is really important. Uh, various consultation processes and co-design approaches. And we do see those types of co-design approaches being very much, um, I suppose, um, promoted in terms of the Horizon Europe and other research funding uh, mechanisms including our own Department of Agriculture uh, funding calls at the moment as well. And given where we're talking about in terms of digitalization, there, there are definitely opportunities to create online platforms and communities, online portals, online surveys, and social media discussions. And education and public engagement, I think, is going to be critically important in terms of highlighting to consumers the importance of and the challenges in ensuring a sustainable food system. And just a concept I just want to share with you is the concept of edutainment. You know, we're talking about education, but it has to be entertaining as well for consumers in terms of engaging them. So education and public engagement should happen um, in that context. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maeve. That's been a, a fantastic presentation as well. So um, it's been a great privilege to, to uh, listen to these four presentations. It's now your opportunity to ask some questions, pose some questions. Please briefly introduce yourself and where you'd like the question directed, um, but over to you. There are no interventions coming from Zoom today. Is that right, Owen? Yep. So we have no excuses. Who would like to go first? Please. Thank you very much for the wonderful uh, presentations. I am Minna Huttunen from the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, Finland. I would like to address my question, especially to the meat production side, because uh, in Finland we very often look at island when it comes to meat or milk production especially, and we also share the potato past. But, so, um, how would you, how would you um, uh, tell about the key success factors in communicating to the public and of course also to the climate plan policymakers on the progress that you have done and the sustainable actions in meat production in Ireland? Thank you. Who would like to start? Sorry, the question was around how do we communicate... I think the question was, may I, may I try and repeat it, but correct me if I'm... The, the issue of communicating to policymakers and government on the successes that have been made, how do you go about doing it? Have I got that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll kick it off. I mean, the, we, we go back in the current phase, we had the publication of the Climate Action Plan, and of course there have been a lot of engagement across government with uh, interested parties in the development of that. Um, but, of course, that then was a final decision made at government about what those targets would represent. And the final agreement that government set and the challenge they set for us was a 25% target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Now, in advance of that, we had, uh, a, and, and we have this regular five-year strategy uh, that's developed for the sector, the latest one being uh, Food Vision 2030, which we signed off on, I think, in 21 or thereabouts uh, at this stage. So all of us, all of the stakeholders in the sector, from farming organizations to NGOs right across the board, engaged in that process and drew up that report, which is effectively an industry report sponsored around government intervention, etc., uh, uh, with all of the various agencies, some of which I spoke about a little bit earlier, engaged in that process. So that, uh, th that was done, that was signed off, and there were agreements in that report uh, that, uh, and actions to be taken associated with those that we now work through in 
the, the beef and sheep vision group that I referenced in my presentation, but also there's a dairy vision group, there's a tillage vision group as well. That's the process of continuous engagement in terms of the implementation of that report. And so that's really how we interface with government across, across all sectors and across all of the relevant government departments that are pertinent to delivering okay. the Climate Action Plan. Thanks, Philip. Maeve, would you want to comment on this? Um, no, I think, that's, I think that whole partnership approach and kind of industry yeah. engagement with policymakers yeah. is, that's yeah. about, yeah. I think there is an interesting point around, uh, around this, and that is really, I guess, the demands on government and policymakers now are far, far more demanding than they were. Dealing with huge levels of complexity which requires the synthesis of evidence from different components. So it shines a really strong light, I think, on some of the points this morning on research, uh, the evidence base to support policy interventions going forward. So it does put a big, big onus, I think, and, uh, you know, Jerry, you may want to comment on, on, uh, on, on Chagask and, and, and uh, its role in terms of creating the evidence base to support policy decision in government. Do you want to comment on that, Chair? No, I, I don't. So okay, right. Another question, right. Question. Moving on. Uh, and there's a lady at the end. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, the, now, I have a question for both um, Philip and, um, and Thomas. Uh, first of all, Philip, do, do you see in, in Ireland, I think we've tended to focus when it comes to climate change in particular, on the reduction in the so-called carbon footprint. And, but yet, uh, there is an issue in respect of the footprint per farm as opposed to the footprint per kilogram of product. And I'm just wondering, what role do you see for research in addressing the challenge around the numbers of animals? I think it applies to both dairy and beef. So I'd be interested in comments. Sorry, the, the last bit of your question, Jerry, was it what? No, I mean, what, what, what can research say, or can it say very much, about the issue around animal numbers as opposed to the, the footprint measured per kilogram of product? Yeah, I, well, you know, one of the issues, of course, that came up in, that, in, in the various discussions that we're having around, even around the volume of animal numbers that we have by way of it being a, an entree to reducing our overall emissions was uh, the proposition that there might have to be a reduction in order to meet our targets. Um, I think, we believe at least, that the research that has been conducted uh, around breeding strategies, uh, the research that has been conducted around um, uh, feed additives and various other uh, uh, developments, potential developments, actual developments, um, are more likely to lead to reduction in emissions per animal, per kilo of beef, rather than necessarily any particular desire to see a reduction in overall animal numbers, if I'm touching on the kind of subject you want, uh, you want me to touch on. And, and when we've, lo we've looked at this, and if you take the suckler herd, for example, the suckler herd is declining at the rate of about 3% per annum at this stage. Um, if that continues to 2030, the impact of that is that we will lose um, about 100,000 tons of, of beef over that period, potentially. Now, the offset to that is, of course, the fact that the dairy sector, the proportion of meat coming from the dairy sector is increasing. So that doesn't actually lead to that absolute level of um, lower production. But of course, the dairy sector is also now at a limit on what it can produce. And we've, we ha we're having a debate in this country at the moment about nitrates and uh, where that's going and what influence that will have in the future. So I, you're better placed on the research side, Jerry, than I am, as you well know, in terms of what we can do. But I do believe that the research community have a huge role to play 
in terms of identifying the measures, as Chagas have done on the MAC curve, identifying the measures that will mm -hmm. enable us to reach our targets. And I think the big piece that is currently lacking is the absolute commitment of government to try and help uh, farmers and the processing sector through that. And I give the example of the early finishing. Um, like we were at uh, 30 months, we're at 26 months now, we're expected to get to 22 months. We're willing to help that process as we have done through the incentives that we have provided through our quality payment systems. We want to bring those graduated down from uh, farmers that are on 28 months to 26 months, those are on 26 to 24, 24 to 22. We believe that that is the best way to get that average number down. Uh, but it does take a fair bit of effort, a lot of time. You've heard Tomás talk about earlier about the costs of doing these things, about changing systems. It doesn't happen easily. If, there's, if, if you want to reach a target, you have to do um, what, 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 what both uh, Brendan and Thomas said, you have to incentivize it. And that means you have to put money at it. And our industry is open to doing that, as I've mentioned already. Uh, we've spent 150 million, we spend 45 million a year on incentives that can enable that. Uh, the government needs to show the same box. Yeah. Do you want to come back in quickly, Thomas, in, in, in respect to um, yeah. Gary's question? Yeah, no, it, I, I, and it is, and there's, I know there's been a lot of discussion around at primary production level exactly how much maybe, and I, I know the most updated MAC, to be fair, tried to specify efficiency measures versus total measures. I personally, as a farmer, um, and I think this is broadly an opinion, we don't really care how many animals, now there are a certain number of farmers who their identities might be tied to the number of animals, but broadly speaking, farmers don't really care about how many animals. What they care about is two figures. One is their total output, and two, much more important to the vast majority of them, their total income. Um, and the reality is we have gone through quite a rapid dairy expansion. Um, that is leveled off. I think everyone is confident enough to say at this stage last year we saw numbers decline slightly. I don't see a major advancement in that. The reality is that the sector as a whole is finding its limit, um, even regardless of what potentially harmful effects could be of, of the limiting of nitrates, um, which could create an artificial limit. When we look at the way the sector evolved a, since 2015, in reality, it was just the exact mirror image of what happened in 1970. Uh, I think I'm right in my, my dates. It was before my time, forgive me, um, in the introduction of quota, where the herd did drastically change from a mixed beef and dairy herd, or sorry, majority dairy herd to a mixed beef and dairy herd, and now it's flipping slightly again with still a higher number of, of beef farms. The other major impact in terms of total emissions, um, as alluded to, is that once expansion stops, the percentage of calves that are born to beef sires will drastically change. Mm -hmm. You go from 40% uh, replacements with 20% of those potentially being um, low quality or lower quality, I should say, dairy males uh, to potentially those having beef genetics. There is a, while th those would appear to be efficiency models, the reality is with the right incentives as mentioned, we can avoid the Jevron's paradox, the idea that we, or the Borlaug paradox, um, whereby we would actually increase the amount of production because there is only a certain amount of calves that are going to be born in the sector, only a certain amount of lambs born in the sector. If we can, re if we can improve the efficiency, reduce the age of slaughter, and also across the entire lifetime, improve the methane output, then we will get a total emissions reduction. Okay. Please. Hello, my name is Natalia. I work here in Chagas and for Biorbic, the Bioeconomy SFI Research Center. And it was reflecting on Brendan's questions around how do we motivate farmers to deliver more ecosystem services. And my questions is addressed to Thomas and Brendan, because I want to listen to your experiences around what kind of initiatives do you think farmers are willing to engage with towards the transformation of food systems? Yeah. Brendan, would you repeat the question to make sure everyone has heard it? Yeah, um, so you're, you're asking what are the type of ways we motivate farmers to deliver more ecosystem services, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah. 
you want me to start, Thomas? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very good question, and it's one that's kind of obsessed me for, for, for a lot of years, because I know within the culture of farming, where I come from, I'm from Waterford, and also I, I've been working with farmers in, in Clare in the West. Um, farmers' identity is very much wrapped up around food production. That's how... Um, that, that's what they do and that's how they're judged by their neighbours and colleagues and um, to move farmers away from that to a bigger picture is, is quite difficult. Um, I think we need to think more about what motivates farmers, so what are the things that they like and they don't like. Um, for me it's clear that paperwork is one thing that farmers hate for instance, so we should create systems which are very integrated and very simple. We've done the opposite, to be honest with you. There's so many schemes and paperwork now that a lot of farmers are terrified and they employ contractors to do the work for them. So that's one thing. To me, another fundamental principle is the freedom to farm. If I'm a farmer, um, okay, making a living is important, but being free to make decisions rather than being told what to do and how to do it uh, is hugely important. And again, with agri-environment, for instance, we've told farmers don't do this or don't do that and we'll give you some compensation um, or do this and this is how you do it um, and don't do that because we told you not to. That's very disempowering and frustrating. Um, I think another key principle for farmers is, um, is the local. I mean, they're, they're very much embedded within the community for, and the landscape for generations and I think I've often heard from farmers that outsiders telling me who know nothing about this place telling me what to do and that's a frustration so if we can move away from that and have local research local advisory services and continuity with it I think a big issue for farmers as well as that you're telling us this now in five years you'll be telling us the opposite so it's having programs which are consistent and continuous and practical so there's a number of things like that but I would come back always to the payment one I think it's not the most important one but it's fundamentally important for me, working with farmers, and I'm sure somebody will contradict me, but the amount of money is just one of the issues. It's the fairness and the transparency of the payment. So I often say if you give a farmer, whatever, 5,000 euros as part of a program and he really engages with it and does great work, if his neighbour next door gets 5,000 euros and does nothing, that farmer won't have the same respect for that money. And this is why we come back to result-based, is that if you get the money, you've bloody well earned it and fair play to you, but you know that the guy next door who didn't engage, he's not going to get it. And that, you get greater respect for the money and for the payment, and you seek out the advice from that. So I think there's, a, there's just a few principles, and I'm, I'm no expert, I just speak from experience, and I'm sure there's better researchers out there who can either contradict or agree with me, but that's uh, a few ideas anyhow, yeah. Oh, and did you have a question? Well, yeah, maybe a Time's up, no. What, I do, I do, I do. I have <laughs> lots of questions. <laughs> But first of all, just to thank the panel very sincerely for a great, pre great opening and mapping out what's something that a word that came up this morning was this idea of a family, right? That we're all in this together, right? And you've done that, you know, from your various perspectives, right from the producer through to the consumer. And one of the things, you know, the challenges that we have, now you were kind, of, we were kind of a little bit of focus there on the challenges facing the farmer or the meat sector, but like the challenges is much broader than that. And I think I liked at the end of your um, education and engage at the end of yours, they're the kind of things that we need to do. And, you know, one of my, my questions is how do we create the education and engagement programs. Brendan, I think you've done it down in the burn by over time bringing the community and the rural community and the farmers together, that they're in this together and they know that they're delivering food and ecosystem services. So I suppose, you know, my, uh, how do we get those education programs or how do we deliver them? And then uh, maybe Thomas, for you, one thing, you said time poor, and you kind of skipped very tr quickly through it. Is that time poor from the farmers and the amount of time that they've got, or is it time poor in terms of how much time we have to address the challenges? Thank you. Okay, there seems to be two, at least two questions in there. Owen, yeah, good. Um, just to say a few words on the education side of things, because it's obviously very important. 
Now, if you were to think about the area that we're in, which is about environmental and also social sustainability, um, when you think about that from the farmer's perspective, there's now so many experts and so many professionals that you're, you're, you're feeling kind of stupid. And in the barn, for example, I think there are so many books and PhDs, myself included, published about the place. There's so, many, so much abstract, uh, information abstracted that, that people were left behind feeling, well, we don't know much because he's the expert, I know nothing. And I think that's a dangerous place to be. So we spent a lot of time over the years giving the information back, having programs through which local school children, farmers, sons and daughters, become the experts. They have the power, they have the ownership, they have the pride that goes with it. And I think that's something we need to address at a national level, to reimagine who, who, like, who is the expert here, who, who, who knows the land and the livestock, and who knows the way to manage it for a certain outcome better, and invest in support in farmers to take ownership of that agenda and the knowledge uh, that they need to, to, to drive on that agenda. So I think it's everywhere, Owen. For us, it's in schools, it's with community groups. We have, last night, we had a talk with the local community all about stone in the landscape. Uh, and again, uh, we have it at a tea talk, it's a social event. We have celebratory events like the Winters Festival and Burn and Bloom. We have um, farmer-led walks. I mean, one of the best things we've ever done is invited a farmer every month to bring a group of people out to walk his farm the response is phenomenal. The, the public get an understanding of what farming is like. The farmer feels empowered by it. People value his or her knowledge. And so there's so many things to do, and it's so important. It takes time. It's the only qualifier. Okay. Would you like to come in, Thomas? Yeah, so I'll start with the short one. No, I meant uh, time poorness is in uh, farmers' actual amount of time that they have on things, and it, it ties into to what Brendan is saying there. Um, more broadly, I think... Um, while we have definitely made advances, and particularly we've seen this in the likes of moving towards peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and discussion group type models as a major step forward, I think I'm going to rewind a little bit first. The problem is often the question starts with how do we educate farmers? You need to start by educating the actual advisors and the researchers. And I don't say that as in uh, I've worked with advisors. The more experienced ones understand the motivations of farmers. That's something that gets left out of a lot of education. Um, th there's an assumption here that every farmer will have the same motivation and you can engage with them the same way. I've often talked to young advisors who actually become despondent um, because they go straight in here, they have wonderful ideas and they have everything they speak to a bunch of farmers. A bunch of farmers say, I don't care about that. And the question is, why? And to go back to actually Maeve's uh, report, she said very rightly, the consumer is not homogenous. The farming community is very much not homogenous. There's kind of base levels of experience that we all experience, but beyond that, the motivations of a, a young dairy farmer in the southeast of the country who wants to expand and grow his business in order to uh, provide for himself and his family full-time farming is not going to be the same motivations as a part-time farmer in the west of Ireland that's running six suckler cows. The, it's not going to be the same thing as someone around uh, Dublin trying to make a go of tillage and horticulture you know, facing into potentially investment funds buying out his land. So there's, there's all these massive challenges. The one thing I would say, uh, one of the things, the best things that could do is for every researcher, it would be mandatory to spend one month having to fill out forms for a farmer as an advisor, because it'll very quickly help to understand that perspective of, Jesus, these people have so much stuff thrown at them. And the other and the last point I'll make, and it's a point that I would, in my previous role in Mocker, would never normally have mentioned, but I do think is actually quite important. Do not underestimate the level of literacy of the farming community, unfortunately. And I'd say that more broadly speaking. Um, unfortunately, a great majority, given the age profile of farmers, never got the opportunity at third level education. Many of them have a decent level of literacy, but this is why I often talk, and, and actually uh, we had a session not that long ago with MSD, one of the, the only main thing I urged them was, for Christ's sake, put a common language uh, insert into your stuff. I don't need to, I can understand what subcutaneous means, but an ordinary farmer, you know, reading it, what the hell does that mean? What, they want a simple answer and answer. I think we can use technology a lot more. I think we, that's one, one thing I would urge is that we have majorly underestimated the technological advancement of even the older cohort. I know, I promise I'm, I'm going to the end. If they can work Dundeal and RIP.ie, they are able to work most apps. Um, you would be surprised how well they are able to, to handle that. Philip, do you want to come in briefly on the response? Uh, well, very briefly, um, and I agree with what has been said. I think uh, we're looking at the education piece, I think, is pretty well at farm level. 
is pretty well developed. Um, maybe there are other dimensions to it, but uh, we have KTs across, uh, knowledge transfer across all of uh, the sectors, I think, pretty much. I think the signpost program is an excellent uh, method at getting to the wider community, and that can be intensified over the next number of years. I think we need understanding, um, and that comes largely to the purchasers of products for consumers, and Mavis touched on a lot of the issues around that. But what is the understanding of what farmers have to do in order to put that food on their table? We don't have enough of that. I think the big thing that we all need to do is have a discussion around the communication. We have a single message here. We shouldn't have to apologize for being farmers or processors of food or exporters. We have to, people need to understand why that is the case yeah. and we need to communicate our message better. Thank you. There's one question at the back and we must not forget maybe. I'm gonna come and ask you a question if no one else does, right? So. something to add. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's warming up now, so th th maybe we can start drawing this. 20 minutes to go. Okay, fine. Sorry. Go. Well, well, this one is for me. But uh, thanks very much to all the speakers. It was really uh, inspiring presentations, actually, because it was so positive. Um, and, and it was really, um, yeah, it gives a, a very positive uh, future outlook. So then to ruin the atmosphere for a minute by being a little bit skeptical. And, and the question is for me, if, is, if, do you think there's a gap between what consumers respond to surveys saying versus what they do in reality when they go into the supermarket? Because I, I noticed, I think it was something like 30% 30, 30 of consumers said, you know, sustainability is very important to them. But then, then when they go in and, and they hunt for the, the Super 6 fruit and veg, looking to see can, how, how cheap they can get a, a packet of carrots, like, is, is there a gap there in terms of what they're saying in these surveys versus what they do? There's a couple of things to that, uh, Rafe. Well, first of all, we do know there is an intention behaviour gap and that applies to everything. You know, we might decide on a Monday we're going to eat healthily this week. By Wednesday, we've changed our minds. So there is that intention behaviour gap in everything we do. But going back to a point I briefly made in the presentation, it depends what we ask as well. So, if, you know, if, if we ask, you know, are, are, you, are you interested in uh, animal welfare friendly production practices? Like, who's going to say no? But if you ask then, you know, if you, put them in, if you put them in a real shopping situation and ask them, they might give you a different answer. So we have to ask the question in the right way, I suppose, um, as well. And then we have to tap into trying to understand why is there that gap between intention and behaviour. And sometimes it's factors that are within the system. So, you know, we talk about, um, again, going back to kind of the health example, there are food deserts in cities, so people can't get access to fresh fruit and veg. So there's that physical barrier or that availability barrier, so they can't transfer that intention into behaviour. So we have to figure out where are those barriers and how can we ensure that. And then it's sometimes that people kind of, you know, forget what's important to them. You go out to the shop, you might want to buy something, but you're in a hurry, you have to get home, the children are going to football or practice or whatever. So you forget what's important, but maybe there are points whereby you can remind people at the point of purchase or various places about their values and what's important to them and try and reinforce their values so that that'll help them to translate that intention into behaviour. And just if I could just go back to the, the point about the education that, that Owen asked um, at the start, I think, and it's a point that resonates with what's said here um, in the panel and also said this morning, we all have responsibility for communicating about the, the importance of sustainable food systems and what we are doing in, in agriculture and food and, and the positive change that we are undertaking. And again, just the point that Brendan was making, you know, we are all experts as well, and not to forget that, and, and, and the, the role of the practitioner as an expert, I think, is much more well recognised um, now. But just to also remind you, we have a great example in Ireland. The Aberdeen Angus Schools Competition is a fantastic example about how we're communicating about uh, how meat is produced in Ireland. Um, it's, a, it's a competition that's run every year for transition year students, and they, they, the students have to do a project about how is this meat produced, how is it cooked, what does it taste like. They work with chefs, they, work, they talk to farmers, they talk to input suppliers, and then they go to Croke Park, which is our big stadium for our national sport, and they have a great day out and they really enjoy it, but they go back as ambassadors to their local school, and I've been involved in judging that for a few years. But last year, I think the winners were from like Ballymun or Ballyfermot or some of that, a real inner city Dublin school. So, you know, there's a real opportunity to 
bring the message to the, not just to the rural children in these kinds of competitions, but very much um, into the urban context as well, and to enable these to be ambassadors and to recognise the positive nutritional aspects from meat and all those things as well. So there's great, great examples out there um, for us to look at, but I think that Aberdeen Schools competition is a great example. Absolutely, and I think just to maybe something to, 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 to consider when we were having coffee and maybe this evening is, I think the question around education skills as well is important in terms of what is the future of work. And the future of work as we've seen it in the past isn't necessarily what the future of work will be in the future. And in some ways, that shift and rebalancing cognitive learning with vocational practical learning and communication skills and creativity is going to have a higher premium. And it's perhaps where we sit in all of this in terms of both employers and, and educators and researchers becomes, uh, becomes pivotal. So, oh, and I'm looking to you in terms of, is this a good point to stop? <laughs> uh, another five minutes? No, no, okay. Right, we're going to wrap up here. Can you all join me in thanking the speakers for um, giving us a great presentation? <laughs> presentation.